Hello, welcome to Gaston Christian Church for April the 19th, 2020. If you are new to us, joining us for the first time, we welcome you, glad that you're here. We're going to do a few brief announcements before we uh, do our worship and everything else, so I uh, hope you'll settle in. Um, first of all, I want you to gather your family uh, in your living room or wherever you can be and maybe project this on the biggest screen that you can if you've, if you've got that technology. Um, it just seems like it works out best if you do your try to pretend you're at church and engage. Uh, you'll get more out of it, I, I, I do believe, and so I hope that you will do that. Um, Minimize your distractions that are around you if you can do that, and uh, give us about uh, 45 minutes, an hour, somewhere along in there uh, this morning, or, or whenever you get around to watching, that would be great. Get your Bible, please. You can turn to Leviticus chapter 4 and have that ready in a few moments. Uh, I'm going to have our scripture on the projected for you, um, but I really want you to have your Bible there with you so you can see it in your own Bible uh, and know where that's at. And if you'd like to take notes, you can. I do have some, uh, some notes that are... Uh, uh, that I'll link in the comments so that uh, you can look at those if you want. Some people like to have the fill-ins, and uh, that's there if you want that um, uh, for you as well. Um, don't forget to give. Uh, the links to our online giving or in the address to the church is there. If you are new to us, we don't expect you to give. This is for our members and our regular tenders, um, but uh, we, we do encourage you to give. You've been very generous. I really appreciate it and just want to thank you for that. Uh, please say hi in the comments, both on Facebook and uh, if you're watching on YouTube there as well. Uh, this is how we know who's there and we can interact with you. If you have something to share with us, you can. Uh, I wouldn't do anything private. Send me a personal message if you want to do something that's, that, that needs to be private. Um, but we hope you'll say hi uh, in the comments and let us know that, that, that you're around. Um, if you have a prayer request, send me an email uh, and you can let me know if that's confidential, if it's something to be shared with the church family uh, to pray about. Kids, be sure to watch Miss Amy's video that was posted this morning in her lesson from First Peter. Uh, make sure you do that in the activities. Just remind you of that. It's on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, everybody says hi to one another, uh, and I keep hearing people say that so-and-so called them and checked on them and how wonderful that is, and I just really appreciate y'all doing that for, for each other. Uh, that's great. Remember, we have our Bible study uh, Wednesday morning at 10 and then a repeat Thursday night at 7. If you would like to join us, we're studying First Peter. Send me a message. It is a, a link to a Zoom meeting that we're not publishing, we'll, but I'll send that out to whoever would like to join us in, in that. Uh, tonight, if you plan to watch The Chosen with us, we're at episode three, send, also send me a note. I'm going to try something different. I can't get things to work the way I want them to, but I'm going to try something different tonight. So you'll need to message me and say, yes, I want to watch The Chosen tonight at eight o'clock. And uh, we'll see if we can get that worked out so that we can all watch it together, maybe comment uh, about it all. Good morning and welcome to Gaston Christian Church for April the 19th. Glad that you're joining us online. If I could get the kids to get up off the couch, if there's room in the living room and it's safe, to help us sing, I've got the joy, 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 joy. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in Oh, my soul. 
please turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 4. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus in your Bibles. We're going to get there in a few moments. We're starting a new series today. Um, We're going to look at the book of Leviticus. I am quite certain that it is not your favorite book of the Bible. Um, It hardly is anybody's favorite book of the Bible. Uh, And probably your life verse does not come from Leviticus, although it's possible it does and you don't know it, but we won't get to that for a couple of weeks yet. if you, like countless other people, have ever made a, a commitment, a plan to read through your Bible, chances are it came unhitched when you got to Leviticus. Genesis is great. It's got a lot of great stories in it and, and, and familiar things in it. You get to Exodus and you have uh, uh, the people leaving Egypt and the Passover and the Ten Commandments. And it, it slows down a little, but still you can get through Exodus. And you hit Leviticus and you hit a brick wall. And I mean, you hit it hard. Leviticus just jumps right in. There's very few stories. It is law. I mean, it is ritual law from the very get-go. I mentioned in my, my promo video that, that, I, um, uh, that I, I told my, my friend Shannon about this, and, and he said, Leviticus and Lazy Boys are not a good combination. So I am well aware of the challenges of preaching Leviticus. Even if we were in church, it would be challenging, but, but more so when you're in your living room. But I really hope you'll stick with it, and, and, and you'll jump in with this. Um, I searched the internet for some other churches and preachers who have preached through the series, maybe to get some ideas and see what they did, and and especially how they titled their series. And one really stood out to me, and I almost used it. Um, it, The title of the series was, You Lost Me at Leviticus. And I thought that was funny, and and, and actually my wife Mary Beth said, that's what you ought to use. But but I I, I found something else I wanted to use uh, even more, uh, even greater than that. I've been reading through the book of Leviticus and in, in, in for several months now in preparation for this message, looking at different things, or th- this series, looking at different things. And um, this one phrase kept leaping out. I don't know how many times I've read Leviticus, I, at least 10, I, I don't know. But I had never noticed, I guess I'd never read it for the preaching purposes of it. And, and so uh, this really leapt out at me. 49 times. In the book of Leviticus, the phrase, I am the Lord, or I am Yahweh, is there 49 times. That is a lot. God makes a statement. He makes a demand. He decrees a law, and he ends it with, I am the Lord, or I am Yahweh. Earlier this year, although it seems like decades ago with with this virus quarantine going on, we did a series on the name of God from Exodus. And I told you that the name of God in the Bible is the name Yahweh. And, and, And that's the name that God gave to Moses and told Moses, this is what I'm to be called. This is what the people are supposed to call me for, for generations to come. But that name, uh, the calling of that name has gotten lost through the, the centuries. Uh, the Jewish people were so afraid to misuse God's name, they quit saying it altogether. Oftentimes, they just called him the name. Um, but his name is Yahweh. And, and anytime you see in your Bibles, especially in your Old Testament, you'll notice this, uh, the word Lord uh, appear in all caps or in small caps like I have it on the screen now. I am the Lord in those small caps. It is that word Yahweh in the Hebrew, and and the Bibles have just translated it, the, the Lord. I like pointing this out to you. All through Leviticus, God uses this phrase, I am the Lord. Or I am Yahweh. It is the reason he makes the decrees that he makes. This doesn't start until chapter 11, verse 44. Uh, Before that, God was giving instructions mostly to Moses. But in chapter 11, he begins giving instructions to the whole nation, to all the people for them to follow. And he says this in chapter 11, the first part of verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. We're going to revisit that later in the series, but I wanted you to see that. 
From that point on to the end of chapter 27, God says, I am Yahweh 49 times. That's pretty powerful. That's that's pretty instructive. So the first thing that I want us to hear, the first thing I want us to understand about the book of Leviticus is that Leviticus is the word of God. It is God's word. It is him saying, I am the Lord. It may be thick, it may be difficult, it may be old, it is old, but it is not to be cut out of our Bibles. In four weeks, we're going we're gonna to see where Jesus quotes from the book of Leviticus. And it's a great quote, and it's one that you are very familiar with. And, and I didn't know until last year, I didn't realize it, that it came from Leviticus. Jesus quotes Leviticus a couple of times, in fact. There are some people today, some Christians, some non-Christians who point to, to things in Leviticus, and, and even some preachers that I've heard that, that just wish it wasn't in our Bibles, that, that wish we could just ignore it and, and, and do away with it. That's, um, that's not good. It's in our Bibles for a good reason. There are some great things to learn from Leviticus. And today we're going to start with, it is so ugly, it's beautiful. I ask people to, to send me some examples of things that are so ugly, they're beautiful or, or, or cute. I've heard it both ways. Um, here's the first one. Uh, Matt Memrick sent in this, uh, this picture of the I-85 and 485 interchange, uh, that's over by Concord Mills. This must have been taken uh, uh, several years right after it opened up. Um, This interchange has won some awards. They're engineering awards, so I don't know if they really count or not. Um, But engineers think it's beautiful. Uh, Matt was like, uh, it looks like a bunch of urban sprawl to me, a bunch of... uh, clear-cut trees to put down some concrete and the pollution it creates. And if you've ever driven over there at Christmas time, you know it's a pretty ugly interchange. But, but anyway, it's a good example of something that is both ugly and beautiful, depending on your perspective. Um, Shannon Gardner uh, sent in this uh, picture of, that's Baby Yoda, for those of you who are uh, not uh, into all of that. Um, um, so ugly, he's cute. Uh, my wife, Mary Beth, that was the first thing that she said when I asked her about that. Um, Amy Griggs sent in this picture of the trolls. This is troll dolls, um, and she said they're so ugly, they're cute. Brenda Patterson sent in a a picture of her dog Maddie uh, with his tongue hanging out, um, but she said because Ronan is petting him, her her, her grandson, um, that it makes it beautiful there. Um, Kara Hunter sent in this uh, picture of a baby opossum, um, so ugly it's cute. All right. And then here's a great video from Amelia about ugly and cute. This was so good. Watch this. It's pretty and ugly. Ugly is a heart. It can be pretty maybe in the inside and, and, and ugly on the outside. Yeah. And sometimes it can switch. What do you mean by ugly, switch? Like ugly in the inside or uh, pretty in the outside. Uh, the outside. Ah, okay. Bye. Bye. Thank y'all for that um, so much. That that those were great. I really appreciate those those examples of it's so ugly, it's it's beautiful. You know, Leviticus opens up with a list of sacrifices and offerings. The first seven chapters outline the various kinds of, of offerings that the Israelites were supposed to do. And uh, this is the part of the Bible that usually ends people's read through the Bible uh, plans. If you were to read those chapters, and, and I'm not at all discouraging you from doing it, I'm, ju- I'm just letting you know what's in there. And it, it, it is not easy reading. You need to be committed to do that. But, but if we had read them, if we had looked at them all, um, and you took notes, you would see some things about it. Uh, First of all, you would see that there is a lot of blood. I mean a lot of blood. Sacrifice after sacrifice, and the details about what to do with which parts of the sacrifice. It it gets pretty graphic in some places. And In fact, the word entrails, um, or the King James calls it inwards, or, or, or internal organs, which is a lot 
softer. The NIV uses that. But the word entrails is used 12 times in the first seven chapters. I picked it out just to show you how gruesome it was. There's a lot of blood that you will notice. Second, there's a lot of, uh, of reasons to sacrifice. You'll notice there's, they're sacrificing for this, they're giving an offering for that, they're doing this, and just a whole lot of things that are in there. There's the burnt offering, the grain offering. The King James calls it meat, but that's probably not a good translation there. Um, there's the peace offering. The NIV calls it the fellowship offering. Um, there's the sin offering and the guilt offering. The King James calls the guilt offering the, the trespass offering. And what's the difference? What's the difference between guilt and, and sin and, and all of that? How do they keep up with all of that? And then they talk about waving certain things before the Lord, like waving the grain, but they also have to wave um, some animals before the Lord. I'm thinking those priests must be pretty stout to, to lift up a lamb and, and wave it before the Lord. There are a lot of rules. And in fact, let's make note of that. When you read Leviticus 1 through 7, you will see, and actually all of Leviticus, you will see that there are a ton of, of rules that people were supposed to follow. Chapters, for instance, one through six are about these five offerings that they're supposed to make. And then chapter seven is all about how to handle those offerings. I mean, it really gets detailed there. And like I said, there's just more rules as you go through the book. No wonder we aren't excited about Leviticus. Who loves rules and blood and all of that? But hold on, and I hope today you're wearing your steel-toed bedroom slippers because you might need them in a few moments, but just, just hold that for a moment, okay? Leviticus also talks about sin. Now, it talks about clean and unclean, what they could eat and what they shouldn't eat, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff, and, and we're going to get to that in the coming weeks or, or touch on that in the coming weeks, but there is a lot of talk about sin in Leviticus, you know, sin has become a bad word. It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Or maybe ironic, one of those. We, and I'm speaking both of us individually, but also us as a society, we try to minimize sin. We laugh at it. We turn it into entertainment. We categorize some of the sin as harmless my, my friend Shannon, who preaches up at Reedsville Christian, he's planning a series for his church that he's titled um, Respectable Sins. And he's going to talk about worry, which is a sin, but we, we kind of like wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah, we all worry. It's okay. Sins of the tongue, ingratitude, anger, pride. These are sins that we have uh, recategorized as, well, they're, they're okay to have. Everybody ought to be angry every now and then, right? You know? But anymore, even the bigger sins, if I can call them that, have become respectable. Lying is acceptable in certain circumstances, according to some people. Even sexual sins, and I mean all of them, infidelity, sex before and outside of marriage, multiple partners, homosexuality, even sex with animals, you name it, it's out there and gaining or has already achieved acceptability in some circles. Talk about sin, and a lot of people go, what's that? They've just erased all the lines. And listen, I'm not trying to beat you up or bring you down or make you feel bad just for the sake of making you feel bad. But we need to see and grasp hold of just how ugly our sins are. Leviticus does that. It makes us uncomfortable because it reminds us that God hates sin and there is a price to be paid for it. I want us to read together from chapter 4. I chose this passage as an example of the prescribed ritual sacrifice. Um, It's identical to what the high priest had to do, uh, what he was required to do for his sins. And and you're going to see some examples of the blood and and of the the rules uh, that are there. Um, But but this is just a sampling of it. Leviticus chapter 4. I'm going to start with verse 13. If the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly... And they do any one of the things 
that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, and they realize their guilt, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bull from the herd for a sin offering and bring it in front of the tent of meeting. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord, and the bull shall be killed before the Lord, Then the anointed priest, that would be the high priest, then the anointed priest shall bring some of the blood of the bull into the tent of meeting, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. And he shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar that is in the tent of meeting before the Lord, and the rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting, And all its fat he shall take from it and burn on the altar. Thus shall he do with the bull. As he did with the bull of the sin offering, so shall he do with this. And the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. And he shall carry the bull outside the camp and burn it up as he burned the first bull. It is the sin offering for the assembly." As I said, this is just an example of what Leviticus 1 through 7 is about. Uh, There is a lot of repetition with the different kind of offerings and things, and I I did not, and I am not going to go and explain them all, Um, but this is a good one to teach us some things. First, I want you to see that, that God addressed a community sin and an unintentional sin. Look at verse 1. Excuse me, verse 13, uh, where he says, If the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally. If the whole congregation does it. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that no one wants to talk about sin. Or or classify anything as a sin anymore. But that just won't work. God says that the whole community can be guilty of sin. Look 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 at what is happening right now. We are being told to stay home, to distance ourselves in public. Even if we ourselves are not sick, why? Because we endanger the whole community. We could have the virus and not know it. We we take all these precautions. There's a big, huge community awareness right now across the world that is based upon our individual actions having an impact for the whole community. Now, this is a Levitical concept. The sins of the individual had impact for the whole community, for the whole nation. And the whole nation could be guilty if it was not dealt with. So, First of all, I I just want you to understand that that sin can affect everybody. Not just individually, but it spreads out. But also notice that it says if they sin unintentionally. And Israel will. Their leaders are going to lead them astray. And through the years, they are going to forget about all of these laws. They're going to forget about the Passover even. They're going to just lose sight of all of this. And and, and, and several centuries later, uh, King Josiah is going to discover these scrolls, these very scrolls, the scrolls of the book of the law. And he's going to read them. And he is going to be devastated that they have not been following God's laws and he's going to call for a revival and and they are going to offer sacrifices for their unintentional sin because generations have gone by and they'd forgotten these things they didn't know but they were still sinning and, and, and all these sacrifices need to be made to make up for that to atone for that now if you think God is not serious about sin you need to read this again He cares deeply about the sins we commit knowingly. And he even cares about the sins that we commit unintentionally. And and, and don't, don't think to yourself, now that's unfair. Remember, God planted his foot 49 times in Leviticus and said, I am the Lord. He makes the rules. He determines what is fair and not fair. You don't have to like it, but that's the way it is. It does not change. 
Let me share with you some words from some scholars about this. Every transgression of a divine command, whether it took place consciously or unconsciously, brought guilt. This is from uh, uh, Kyle and Delich is, is one of the, the premier Old Testament scholars, uh, what he has to say. Here's another one. Every tra- uh, the significance of the objective sense of guilt, and, and, and he's talking about the objective sense of guilt, is uh, talking about the Hebrew word tense that, that's there. The significance of the objective sense of guilt is that even if they do not feel particularly guilty, or even, I- or even know of their guilt, they are still guilty before God. You see, when we sin, whether it be individually or collectively, knowingly or unknowingly, even if we have our own peace about it and and we feel good about it, we're still guilty. God says sin is sin no matter what. We need to understand that. We need to believe that. Now, that's not the end of it. But it is a necessary step in understanding what we need to know. Here's the next thing, and, and this is what some of you might need your steel-toed slippers for this morning, okay? These laws, these offerings, these rituals, these were what was required for the people to be near to God and to be right with God. David, the psalmist, wrote the the longest chapter of the whole Bible, Psalm 119, about how much he loved the law. In, In verse 97, he says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And he's talking about Leviticus. He's talking about all five books of of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He's talking about all of them, but he's talking about Leviticus here. I love the law, he says. Why? Because that's how. That is the way that God gave for them to be near him and to be right with him. Those were the rules. Let me illustrate, and this is a perfect illustration. Again, what's going on, and I, I'm sorry that every week I keep talking about the, the virus and, and what's happening. These are just some perfect illustrations of what's happening. Some of you, probably most of you, would do and are doing whatever it takes to be near the people that you love. For instance, some of you are really missing your grandchildren. And and through this uh, quarantine, you've not been able to see them, not been able to hug them, not been able to kiss them, not been been with them. I've seen some posts on Facebook, talked to some of you, and and, and I know what that's like. You've told me what that's like. And you would do anything to see them, right? I, I mean, you would wear a mask. Even though it's hot and uncomfortable, you would wear a mask so that you could be near your grandkids. You would wash your hands and and soak them in hand sanitizer till the skin starts to peel if that's what it took for you to be able to be near your grandchildren. You will sit in driveways and, 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 and look at them from a distance. You'll get in their yard and wave at them or or whatever it takes just to see them. You will even learn. Tech, new technology so that you can uh, see them on, uh, on video <laughs> because you will do whatever it takes to be near those you love, right? You might even break the law. You might even break the, the governor's quarantine order. Well, maybe that's a bad example when we're talking about following the rules to talk about breaking the rules. So maybe we'll just skip that one. But you get what I'm saying. You will do Whatever it takes, whatever's required, so that you can see those you love. God said, You want to be in my presence? You want to come near me? You want to, to call on my name? You, you, you want to worship me? You want to be right with me? Okay, here are the rules. Here's what you need to do. We're willing to wear a mask. They were willing to do these sacrifices and follow all these rules and rituals so that they could be near God. That's why they did it. 
David loved God so much that he loved the law that permitted him to be near God. You know, I know some of you can't wait for church to be open again, for you to see one another, to be able to hug one another once again, or just to even be closer than six feet apart. And, and that's great. I, I, am, I, am, I'm, I can't wait for that either. And that's a wonderful thing about fellowship. But listen, we ought to always, always have that kind of desire and hunger to be in God's presence whatever it takes. We ought to have such desire that our attitude ought to be, no matter what it takes, I want to be with God and his people. Now, I'm not talking about breaking quarantine. I'm not talking about that sort of thing. I'm talking about our priorities. I'm talking about worship, being, being of the right heart and of the right mind. Okay, now here is the really, 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 really good news, all right? God made a way for their sin to be atoned for, for their guilt to be taken away. For us, Jesus is that way. None none of us have to do what they had to do. No more bulls, no more goats, no more sheep. No more grain, sheaves of grain waving in the air. We don't have to do any of those things. We don't have to bring those things to God in order for God to be pleased with us. If you want to dislike all of those Old Testament sacrifices, all the blood, all the burning of the fat, all the the talk of entrails and, and the fellowship offerings and the wave offerings and things we just don't understand, fine. Not because we can rip Leviticus out of the Bible, but because Jesus came and took care of it, all of it, forever. We don't have to keep all of those offerings straight. We don't have to know what they mean. We don't have to take a sacrifice to the priest and and worry if it's good enough, if God is going to accept it. All of that, every minute detail was totally satisfied by Jesus. In, in, In fact, we talk about the offering being acceptable to God, what could be more acceptable than his own perfect son? That sacrifice was acceptable and accepted by God on our behalf. Now, there's more to learn from Leviticus. We're going to talk about holiness and about worship, about loving our neighbor and some more about sin. But the first thing, the most important thing to remember is that Jesus took care of the hard stuff. Our job now is not to try and make God like us, but rather to show appreciation to him for what he has already done for us. When we look at Leviticus, we can see what was taken away, the price that was paid that we don't have to pay anymore because of Jesus. All right, so here's the bottom line for today, okay? First of all, we need to take sin seriously. It still separates us from God. That didn't change. Jesus did deal with it. He took it away. He paid for it on the cross, and he buried it, and he rose again. He dealt with our sin. But sin in our lives today still separates us from God, and we need to take it seriously. Secondly, we need to love God's word and God's presence. We can take those things for granted, minimize them, think they're not all that important. I'm impressed by all that was required just to meet with God in the Old Testament, just to to be right with him. And the people willingly did it. I need that kind of heart and commitment. And here's the third thing I want you to, to take away from today. And that is to be in awe of what Jesus did. By looking at Leviticus, we can gain a deeper appreciation of our own salvation. If you need your sins atoned for and your guilt taken away, I would love for you to message me so that we can talk about what the Bible teaches about being born again and and what Jesus did to, to take care of that for all time. 
So if that's where you are, I, I hope that you will message me about that. Let's close in prayer. God, our Father, I am so thankful and grateful for your word. Even the parts that I don't understand, even the parts that um, are, seem archaic to me, because in reading them, I see just what it meant for Jesus to die and how seriously you take sin and, and what a danger it is to us today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for that gift. I pray that you would um, instill in me the desire to worship you, to be near you, to read your word and to love it. Father, um, we pray for an end to this season of, of quarantine so that we could be back together as one body in one place, <clears throat> worshiping you. Father, pray for those that are sick, uh, both with the virus and other people who are suffering because they can't get uh, the, the, the treatment, the, the doctor's visits they need because of that. I pray that all that would end soon and uh, that you would watch over them. Bless each family. Father, you are a lovely, wonderful God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I hope that you will join us for a time of communion.
Good morning. For my communion devotion, I'm reading out of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 16 through 22, and from the message. It says this, Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of the hostility. Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. That's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name as Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all irrespective of how we got here in what he is building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as this cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God. All of us built into it, a temple which God is quite at home. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you now, we are mindful and we remember the death of your son, Jesus, who saved us, who brought us together. Father, we're thankful for that cornerstone which gives us life and hope and salvation. And at this time, as we take his blood and his body, we remember his death. Amen. As you will get out your bread, and your communion cup. Let us take the bread and be reminded of his body as we share it together. And now let us remember his blood as we share the cup together. Sweet. 